Hello and welcome to the final chapter of Principles of Management, Management 2209. Today we're going to be talking about the final element um, of management. If you remember the acronym again that we created uh, and talked about at the very beginning of the semester, which was POLK, Planning, Organizing, Leading, and Controlling. So today we'll wrap everything up talking about control and what managers do um, and, uh, regarding control and why it's so important. Here are the learning outcomes for the chapter. Give you a little bit quicker look at those. So what is control and how the, how's it compared to standards? So I looked up I wanted to look up different meanings for the word control. And the best uh, meaning that I could find was regulate. And if you notice, it's the very first word in the definition of control, which is the regular, regulatory process of establishing standards to achieve the goals of the company. And by comparing actual performance against those standards and then whenever there's a difference or some type of variation taking corrective action. Standards are regularly or widely used so it's a it's a basis of comparison. Uh, we all have standards that we live by and it's sort of the same thing. If you think about your work there are certain standards that are just assumed uh, either they were told by you or you observed them and they you realized immediately that they were standards. And we'll talk about what those types of standards are. But standards are basically the comparison that you use to determine whether or not the, your performance or the organizational's performance is satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So we have those two elements. We have control and standards that as, as a manager, we have to understand uh, how we're going to use those in order to manage more effectively and efficiently. So how do we set standards? Well, one of the things that we do is we listen to customer feedback. We, a customer will tell you whether or not they are satisfied uh, they'll either tell you or they won't come back uh, to purchase to repurchase an item or a service that you have. If they're really dissatisfied, they, they may complain to you or others. So customer feedback has a lot to do about how we set our standards. We observe competitors or observe into others in the industry and see what they do and how they do it and what the type of product what types of products they produce so by observing competitors we set standards and we'll, I'm going to talk here in a second about benchmarking and why as a manager it's important to understand the understand the term and understand the process of benchmarking so what is benchmarking it's basically when we measure our performance against someone in the business um, that is considered the best in the industry or best in class. So the point of benchmarking is to identify opportunities within the company that we can improve on and try to match or exceed those that we are measuring against such as a competitor or someone else in the industry that is considered the best at whatever we're comparing. Um, so it involves identifying companies to benchmark against so we can set those standards, collecting data, and also imitating the process of that company that we're benchmarking against. So I have a really good example that I created here, uh, and I think I may have mentioned this in class before at some point earlier in the semester. 
But before I go to this slide, I, I just want to sort of set, uh, give you the setup. Um, for years, delivering packages, this is pre-overnight delivery, was uh, delivering packages quickly across the country was very expensive because it, it entailed so much work uh, from the company that was delivering these packages. A company came on the scene that disrupted the overnight delivery uh, package business. That company was FedEx. FedEx became the benchmark of overnight delivery. And the reason they became the benchmark that UPS and the United States Postal Service and all the other DHL, all the other overnight companies, overnight delivery companies, compared themselves to was because they did it so uh, efficiently and they did it so uh, proper that they were considered the best. And the, the, the simple reason of why they were the best is because they developed a uh, spoken hub delivery system. And I th again, I thought, I, I think that I mentioned this before, but if you take a look at the hub and spoken network of FedEx, you'll notice that from every city in the country, an overnight package is shipped directly to Memphis, Tennessee. That's their hub. And then from Memphis, Tennessee, they are the packages are sorted and shipped out again. This is the most efficient way to deliver overnight packages. Even if you were in Fairmont, West Virginia, and you were overnight uh, sh shipping a package to Charleston, West Virginia, your package is going to go from Fairmont to Memphis, from Memphis to Charleston. That is the most efficient way and the quickest way to get it there. Now, obviously, driving it from um, Fairmont to Charleston would seem the quickest way. But when you're dealing with so many packages and from all over the world, the hub and spoke network is the best way to deliver. So FedEx became the benchmark of that type of that in that industry, and everyone emulated them. And imitated them and so that's what benchmarking is uh, and we can do it ourselves as managers if we are managing people there may be someone that we really admire as being a really good manager we could benchmark ourselves against them that would be a way to improve our standards and to always exceed our expected performance level so, once we've set standards, what do we do with those standards? Well, let's talk about comparing, comparison to standards and corrective actions. So, when we compare our standards, um, we're trying to determine whether or not we, were, we are underperforming or overperforming. If we are underperforming, we may have to take corrective action which means basically trying to identify that difference or that deviation, analyzing those differences or deviations, and then developing some type of program and implementation process to correct those deviations or differences. So I'll give you an example in sales. Uh, if you were a salesperson and every month, you were to make uh, 200 cold calls, which means you just basically go knocking on doors of businesses, seeing if they need your product or want your product. Maybe it's advertising or, or whatever. And so 200 cold calls is, is your first goal or your first standard. And then let's say that your uh, sales goal is we'll just pick a number and say $25,000 a month. You need to sell whatever you're selling, you're selling $25,000 worth of it in the month. At the end of the month, if your sales goal 
uh, or your actual sales is only $20,000 and you fall $5,000 below your standard and the number of cold calls that you make was only 125, well below the standard that was set, then there would be some, some type of corrective action that may have to be put into place. One, it may be additional training. Two, it may be some guidance from the manager who might even go along with you several days during the month to, to show you how to make enough calls. Uh, maybe you're doing something uh, wrong, you're wasting time, or you're spending too much time on each call, or maybe you're just not working at all, whatever it is, uh, some type of corrective action might be put into place. But all types of jobs, all types of positions uh, use this, some variation of this type of process, where you look at your standards and uh, you compare them based on your actual performance and determine whether or not corrective action needs to take place. Here's just a basic, what, what the, the authors call a cybernetic control process. Cybernetic meaning staying on course or, you know, keeping up with the standard. You set your standards. If you take a look at the right-hand side of the graphic, you set your standards, you measure the performance, you can compare your performance with the standards and you identify deviations. If there's deviations, you analyze those and you develop some type of corrective action program. And then you go through the process again. Now, you may identify that the deviations are on the positive side. Now, that's a good thing, but it could be that if you see a, a wide deviation of positive uh, differences, in other words, people are really overachieving, maybe the standards are set too low. And, this, and so standards may be, have to be reevaluated. There's three basic control methods, and I'll be honest with you, the very first one is the most common type of control method. And that's the feedback control method. This is where we gather information about our performance deficiencies after they occur and then use some type of corrective action to prevent those uh, performance de uh, deficiencies from happening again. This is the most common uh, method of control uh, among most industries. Concurrent control is gathering information about performance deficiencies as they're occurring. Now, where would this actually take place? Well, this could happen on the manufacturing lines where uh, there's control processes in place that can spot problems as they're occurring on the manufacturing lines. Mylan Pharmaceuticals in Morgantown uh, produces... Uh, pharmaceuticals, they produce pills. There are people that actually will stand on the line uh, observing those pills as they come out of the press to see if there's any deficiencies or abnormalities uh, with those pills as they come out of the pill presses. If they see a continued uh, uh, trend of abnormalities, they may stop the line uh, to see exactly what the problem is. That would be a concurrent control. And then there's feed forward, feed forward control, which is just the opposite of feedback, where you're monitoring performance inputs to minimize performance deficiencies before they occur. So this may be making sure that you set the correct standards, that you make sure that all the inputs are of high quality, making sure everyone understands exactly what they, they're doing. So feed forward control happens pretty much simultaneously all the time with a lot of the other controls. Because you're always, I mean, you've heard the saying garbage in, garbage out. This is where uh, you would make sure that the quality is uh, quality levels being looked at and tended to before production begins. So maintaining control, is it worth it? Control loss uh, basically states that 
it occurs basically when behavior procedures do not conform to standards. In other words, there's a, there's some type of loss that is occur, incurred. If you if we take a look at the sales example that I just gave a minute ago, what was the loss? Well, if the standard was twenty five thousand and the salesperson only produced twenty thousand dollars worth of sales, the loss was five thousand dollars to the company and the commission that the uh, salesperson lost. But what has to take place when you're evaluating these uh, deficiencies, is it, is it worth um, regulating? In other words, what are the costs associated with the type of control that's going to be needed to bring things back up to standard? If it's going to cost me $20,000 to have this person retrained, then maybe I need to take a look at uh, how I can control in a different manner. Or maybe I need to lower the sales standard for the uh, individual. Or maybe perhaps I need to fire uh, or terminate the individual. So to determine if the control is worthwhile, uh, managers have to basically look at it and say, is it worth regulating or is it going to cost me more to regulate it than it, than it would the loss uh, from not control, from not maintaining uh, control? Is it feasible? Uh, so cybernetic feasibility is the extent to which it is possible to implement each step in the control process. So if we were thinking about standards, one of the things that uh, came to my mind in the forefront was the coronavirus and how we've been, um, the United States has been testing, trying to test as many people as possible with the coronavirus. But if you, as you well know, in order to be tested at this point, currently, you have to exhibit some type of symptom of the virus. In other words, it's not feasible based on the number of tests that we have, based on the number of healthcare professionals that we have to conduct the test. It's not feasible to actually test everyone in the United States. We can only test, currently, we can only test people who are exhibiting symptoms of the disease. It would not be cybernetic feasible to actually test everyone. Now, at some point, it may be where the number of tests have been uh, increased and they, they may even have a home test that they're working on. Then the feasibility may be there where we can test everyone. But actually the cost and the feasibility right now to test everyone in the United States is, is it's not there. And so only the people with symptoms are being tested. There's different kinds or various control methods. And we're going to talk about these five um, before we wrap things up on this final chapter. There's bureaucratic control, objective control, normative control, and I'll focus on those three primarily, but there's also conservative control and self-control. So what is bureaucratic control? Well, you have heard of bureaucratic red tape, and basically when you think of a bureaucracy, you're thinking of rules and regulations and policies and laws and procedures and all of these things that are put into place to actually maintain control. So there is a lot of bureaucratic, bureaucratic control in government. Uh, our government and all governments have a lot of bureaucratic control where there's laws and rules and regulations that everyone has to abide by. Um, so there's a greater emphasis on following rules and a bureaucratic control process is much more resistant to change and it's also slow to respond. That's why it's 
often the case where people will say that um, the government is very slow to respond to something. Although I will say um, that our our government responded fairly quickly to the coronavirus uh, pandemic and have done uh, a fairly good job of trying to control the spread and flattening the curve. But they did that by uh, avoiding or bypassing some of the rules and regulations that have, and procedures that have been put into place prior. And the president of the United States has had to declare certain um, declarations in order to do that. Uh, the bureaucratic red tape was just enormous. And in fact, um, some of the problems with testing came from uh, some bureaucratic control problems that the Center of Disease Control had put into place. And these bureaucratic control policies actually uh, held back testing. And then the testing that was available at the very beginning was... Uh, not performing the way it should. So um, usually bureau bureaucracies are very slow to respond and they're very resistant to change because of all these rules and regulations that have been put in place for uh, many years. There's objective control. Now objective control is simply being able to have observable measures uh, that we can look at and uh, the example here that I put is to pass the course, you must earn at least a 60% of the total points. Well, that's a very observable measure. You can take the number of points that you've earned throughout the course uh, and see if it's at least 60% of the total possible points for the course. It's an observable measure. So a use of observable measures of worker behavior um, is an objective control. And there's two types. There's behavior control, where we there's the regulation of behaviors and actions that workers actually utilize and perform on the job. And there's output control, where we look at workers' results and via the rewards and incentives that we, uh, that we give. So objective control, just think of it as being objective, meaning that you actually see or measure uh, and determine whether or not the, uh, the uh, performance is meeting expectations. Normative control is, and I mentioned this earlier in the, uh, <clears throat> in the presentation, um, normative control is where we workers' behaviors and decisions are regulated basically through the organizational, how the organization has been set up and the values and beliefs of the organization. So think of it this way. There are certain standards that you uh, set in an organization and those standards are followed through, through everyone. And you can actually um, observe or listen to people um, listen to stories about how things have always been done. And so that's, that's one thing you'll hear from some people. Well, we always do it this way. This is the way we always do it. That's a, a type of normative control. I'm trying to think of an example for you all uh, here at Pierpont. One of the things that some people might say is to get a good grade, you need to attend class. So if you're in a face-to-face -face class, unfortunately, we know that things have changed this semester because of the virus. But if you think uh, about it, attending class relates to good grades or better grades. That's a normative control. We know that that's how it's been in higher education or in school in general. And so it's, that's a type of normative control. Um, con there's concertive control. I'll let you read that, but this is not one that I'm focusing on. Um, and then there's self-control or self-management, where you set your own goals and you monitor your progress. In a lot of high-tech companies where they have self-managing teams, this self-control, self-management is absolutely 
uh, necessary uh, in, in order for the teams to be successful. The last thing that I want to talk about is uh, what's called a balanced scorecard. And this would be more of um, an entire company, but a measure of organizational performance that is looked at in four areas, financial, uh, marketing or customers, internal operations, innovation and learning. And, and these four could be different departments. They, they could be a different four areas. They could be six areas, seven areas, um, depending on the company. However, what the balanced scorecard says is that each individual area is rated. And so one of the things about that is it focuses managers in all areas to meet and exceed their their goals and uh, helps uh, the, the organization to measure the performance. It minimizes the chances, chances excuse me, of sub-optimization, meaning that we don't steal from one area to do well in another. In other words, we want all areas of the organization, all departments of the organization to meet or exceed expectations. So improved performance in one part of the firm is not at the expense of another part or another department. So a balanced scorecard minimizes the chances for that because every area is being, the performance is being measured in every single department. So if I looked at a restaurant, a balanced scorecard might be the kitchen, uh, the bar, or the service area where, where the people eat. So we don't want the overperformance in the kitchen to take away from the service area or the bar. We want each of those three areas to meet or exceed their goals. And that way we minimize the chance of uh, sub-optimization. This here's some way to control finances, for example, through income statements and financial ratios, balance sheets. I'm not going to ask you anything on this, but this is just an example of how the finance department or the accounting department might be controlled. Managing customers, but making sure that customers don't uh, are making sure that customers are always satisfied and that they don't leave uh, leave us as customers. And this gives you an example of the innovation and learning perspective. And that pretty much wraps up the final chapter. Uh, there is a chapter 14 and combination quiz of both chapter 14 and 16. It's 10 questions, not all that difficult. I will tell you that most of the questions come from chapter 16, but there are two or three questions from chapter um, chapter 14. So just, if you can, uh, review that once again, and you should be ready for the quiz. I will tell you that there is a, um, there will be a recap video uh, that will be uh, posted on uh, sometime next week, the week of April 20th. If you have any questions uh, regarding the course, uh, let me know. I, am, I, I do know that um, it, this semester has been uh, difficult for everyone, but I think it's been especially difficult for us in this class. We, it was a hybrid class. We only met once a week. Our second and third week was taken away from us because of a holiday. And then if you remember, campus was closed because of a water break. And uh, I hope that you, you, know, you, you, you got enough out of this class, uh, but you, we have been behind the eight ball. So I am not going to, uh, what I mean by that is, I am going to take that into consideration. Uh, when ass assigning the final grades. I want you to know that I will be lenient on the lenient side. I will grade with a curve. Uh, I want everyone to make sure that um, 
the the people who attended and took the quizzes and did you know major grades i mean there will be grades but uh, i do want you to know that I, I i do understand that this class is uh has been up against the wall a little bit more than the others. So anyway, there will be one final video that I will post next week, and uh, that'll sort of be our uh, bon voyage or farewell uh, video. Again, I hope you're staying safe, keeping uh, social distance, and uh, talk to you on the final video next week. Take care.